how many notes can we fit in an octave? Okay, so this video is for anyone who's figured out that pitch can be quantized differently from how it is on a standard piano. When you've got a piano with 12 equally spaced notes, or 12 equal divisions of the octave, or 12 EDO, there are actually other notes in between. Hear it? Okay, so now you know what microtonality is. When people say microtonality, they're referring to notes your piano doesn't give you. That's it. One more thing to know, uh, one twelve hundredth of an octave is called a cent. One twelve hundredth of an octave is called a cent. A cent is thus the smallest unit of 1,200 tone equal temperament, and there's 100 cents in a standard half-step. Cents make it easy to talk about pitch distances by how they are related to 12 EDO. Now, there's lots of tuning systems you could use instead, like 13 tone equal temperament, or 14 tone equal temperament, or 15 tone equal temperament. How far can we go? And what is the most amount of notes we can cram into an octave? And what does this mean? We can actually answer this question in a few different ways. Hey, and guess what else? You don't have to use equal divisions of the octave in your tuning system. That's just, it, it's important that I mention that, or the people who don't like to use equal temperament will get upset. But this is mostly an equal temperament video, just because imagine you have a million notes per octave and all of them except one are within one cent and then the very last one is just a tritone. That doesn't really make for a million notes per octave kind of feeling now, does it? So that's why we're doing the equal temperament thing. Anyway, back to the video. The two main questions we need to consider are, one, how many notes per octave can our instruments reliably produce? And two, what is the smallest pitch difference we can hear? Let's begin by answering the first question. How many notes per octave can our instruments reliably produce? Well, there are acoustic instruments, and fretless ones can produce a huge variety of pitches in an essentially free pitch space. But saying that fretless instruments give this seems like cheating, and not really an equal temperament not really a number of notes that we can cram into the octave. What about in discrete, quantized equal temperaments? Well, the best instruments for playing precise pitches are computers. Although pianos and fretted guitars are exceedingly common in popular music because of the easy access to harmony, they are actually two of the most difficult instruments in which to cram more notes to the octave. The piano gets really wide really quick, and guitar frets start to get crammed. There are various synthesizers that have a fine resolution. For example, the resolution of the continuum keyboard is one-tenth of a cent, so that gives 12,000 tone equal temperament. So how can we test the limits of these electronic situations? Well, we could think of the smallest quantized MIDI pitch bend. MIDI pitch bend is a message that can be used to microtonally tune pitch. Joe Monzo helpfully points out that quantizing the MIDI pitch bend results in 196,608 notes per octave, which gives a smallest size of about 0 0.0061035 cents. But we can get smaller for programs that don't use MIDI. For example, on my computer in Max MSP, I slid the floats around and observed that the most zeros Max allows after the decimal is 5. Assuming 20 kHz for smallest pitch difference, that can give us the smallest interval of around <laughs> cents. Really small. It's also possible that playback systems MIDI 2.0 and bit depth resolutions could change this limit. 
So I guess our high estimate for now is about, well, if we have that smallest size for Maximus P, 14 billion tone equal temperament about. I didn't really check Max's bit resolution and how that would affect this in a more nuanced way, so I'm sure there is a more in-depth explanation, which I'm sure people will be providing in the comments. Okay, great. So we answered that first question. Now let's answer the second question, which is a bit more drawn out and personally, I think a bit more interesting. There are different fuzzy areas of microtonal steps that become really important as our first interval in the tuning, or the smallest interval in our tuning, the degree, gets smaller and smaller. We'll call this small interval a degree. So one degree of 12 tet, or 12 EDO, or 12 tone equal temperament, is one twelfth of an octave, or say, E to F. As others have mentioned, how well we can discriminate pitch depends on context. Another thing to note is that there's tons of factors that influence pitch perception. So lots of these precise ear training situations have to be extremely clinical as a result. Just a few examples of things that could affect our pitch perception so that we're not very precise in terms of hearing sense are uh, the Doppler effect, loudness affecting perception, the ear's presence for stretching and shrinking certain intervals, virtual pitch, combination tones, categorical perception, etc, etc. Our standard half-step in 12-tone equal temperament, or 12 EDO, is 100 cents. So let's start decreasing the size of our smallest scale step. When we get to 50 cents here, that note falls right in between two piano keys on a standard keyboard. So this is named a quarter tone, even though where I come from, a quarter is 25 cents. <laughs> when I play a note, and the note a quarter tone higher, Do they sound like different notes to you, or retunings of the same note? That's the first question we need to answer. What's the fuzzy boundary where two notes start to sound like retunings of a single note, instead of legitimately different steps? Now, if you haven't trained in microtonal systems, the quarter tone itself might sound like a retuning. But you can go smaller. From unofficial conversations with other experts and my own experience, I tend to think that around 25 to 30 cents is a good boundary for the smallest sort of microtonal step that doesn't sound like a retuning. There's a quote from Ivor Derrick, holy father of the Zenharmonic Alliance, that illustrates this really well. Now, we could define Zenharmonic as having more or less than 12 pitch classes, in many cases if that is our pleasure. In a system like 19 tone or 31 tone equal temperament, or unequal temperament beyond 12, we can have 19 or 31 or 22 or some other number of pitch classes up to a certain point. This point is somewhere around 45 or 55 equally spaced tones. When using unequal systems with certain very small intervals, then one begins to wonder, are the two flats? Two Bs? A comma apart in just intonation, or in, say, the 53-tone temperament, within one pitch class or two. So there very well may be more tones per octave than there are pitch classes. I'll leave this with a theory question you can torment your enemies with. Is a bent note still a member of the pitch class from which it was bent, or does it start a new pitch class, or what? Good question, guy. I don't have an answer for you. I'm going to go with that quote even though it's a little smaller than what my own experience dictates. If we assume that this happens around 45 to 55 notes, then let's arbitrarily estimate 55 EDO where the smallest step is 21.81 cents. So this is our arbitrary bound for um, smallest step versus retuning of the same note. The next kind of smaller step size we might hear could be called a comma, though not necessarily. There are many different kinds of specific comma sizes, which we will get to here. In this next zone, from about 55 EDO to 150 EDO, or 21 to 8 cents, 
we hear two adjacent pitches melodically as retunings of the same note. They don't sound as distinct from one another. A commonly used tuning, for example, falling into this category, would be 72 tone equal temperament. Now that we've talked about what constitutes a chroma, or a difference between two clearly different, you know, categorical notes, and a comma, retuning of the same note, let's talk about how small we can even perceive a step. To address this, we have to talk about something called the just noticeable difference in pitch, or JND for short. The average just noticeable difference across the frequency range is about 6 cents, and Schauer and Bedolf found this in 1931. Uh, since the JND is, of course, a fuzzy boundary, it is not absolute. That is to say, it's quite possible to notice melodic differences of less than about 6 cents. It's just usually tougher. The special attribute about the JND that's important is that notes start to sound so similar to each other as steps that it becomes difficult to tell whether it's gone up or down. But you might be able to tell a difference, you know? That's what separates a smaller JND-like melodic movement from a more noticeable microtone, or comma. The JND refers to melodic phenomenon, average pitch discrimination, in range. If you give an average person two pitches played one after the other six cents apart and tell them to try and tell the difference, then many people would just barely be able to do so in the mid-range. Many might not hear difference at all. Whether a pitch difference is heard may depend deeply on our level of focus. The timbre starts to become really important in this kind of basic test because the more rich the timbre is, the more clues it will give you across the range as to whether pitch A is different from pitch B. Yeah? Since sine waves give you no extra timbral clues at all, they're the most difficult. Since hearing small intervals is a special kind of ear training skill, I also decided to interview some musicians who specialize in hearing nearly down to the scent in music. What's the highest number of notes per octave that you think you would ever use in your music? Um, if you um, had to ballpark it. Yeah, I mean, for me, it really depends on the physical interface because I don't want to sacrifice the ability to jam and right. just free and freely create. I would say... Um, Let's see, I'd have to go looking. I don't really do much with EDO, so I'd have to do some. I would say probably anything that gets within two cents. So, I don't know, um, maybe like, mm, I think I could see myself using probably 200 notes an octave. Yeah. In I feel like that's like certainly doable. Um, what would that be? That would be six cents. Yeah, that's actually super doable. So, I mean, really, if I took 1,200 and I'd have to calculate a little, I would say probably 600 notes per octave is like the highest I would really ever bother doing. Um, somewhere in that ballpark, obviously, I wouldn't use 600 flat, but somewhere around a two cent window to me is pretty acceptable for for the whole interval spectrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I also wanted to talk about how you hear um, intervals that are around the just noticeable difference. Mm -hmm. Is there sort of a boundary where you notice that things are getting really small and it's hard to tell whether the note is going up or down? Or do you not really have that sensation until it gets around like three cents? Like, what is that sensation like for you? I don't really have that sensation until it gets below a cent. Oh, wow. So one cent to me is very noticeable. Like if I were to just take, you know, this and go. Oh, wait, hold on. I have it in unison. But if I were to just take a, a saw wave and just. 
Was that? That was one cent, and that that's was a cent noticeable. higher. Yeah, I Can feel like it it's again? super noticeable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll go a cent lower. So I'll do it one more time. Like that to me is pretty noticeable, but that's a single cent. You know, I feel like this is just a me thing. I feel like my brain, whenever I'm dealing with things below a JND, it's like my brain is trying to play a trick on me. And actually, oh, I have a perfect yeah. analogy because I'm like, with the one that you played where it went higher, I like legitimately heard that. And then with the one where you were going lower, I was kind of like, really? You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I definitely think there's this weird perceptual thing where it's like, you don't hear it, but you sense it. Yeah. You know, like, a below like two cents for me, I don't like hear it, but I, I feel it and I know that it changed. And um, I mean, I do hear it, especially if it's, har if it's harmonic. Hearing below a cent harmonically is really easy. Um, but melodically, one cent to me is a subtle shift in sort of like, it's, it's just like, a, you know, when you're at like the eye doctor and they're like one or two, one yeah. or two. And it's like so subtle, but there's like something different. That's how I feel. And then I, I feel the direction that that subtlety moves in. And um, yeah, it's been pretty consistent when I've done some of the double blind tests. And, you know, you did that one test where you moved something by a scent and I was able to hear that one pretty yeah, clearly. Yeah. It's actually super easy with any samplers, super easy with any digital, um, digital equipment. And it's pretty easy within the, first, or within the middle two octaves of an acoustic piano. So... Right, right. And probably instruments with vibrato wouldn't be able to... Right, right. I definitely feel like a one cent difference if you have vibrato going on is a lot less noticeable. But, you know, I've heard like people joke before and say like, oh, you know, Z like cares about, uh, you know, getting down to like two cents, but at the same time has like a 30 cent vibrato on her cents, you know? And, <laughs> uh, and for me, it actually does matter. Um, if I'm thinking about vibrato as the center point for the wobble, I feel like I can sense like different, let's say a, a, I have something like a 537 compared to a 551 cent uh, super fourth, I can really hear a substantial difference if they're vibratoing centered around those two different points, even though it's, you know, um, 13 or 14 cents out. Same with below 13 or 14 cents. Like even though vibrato obscures the pitch, there's still this like center balance to it that um at least digitally that uh does make a big difference to me acoustically vibrato is obviously a bit more nuanced and i don't think that i don't think you're going to perceive a one or two cent difference to the center note when someone's doing vibrato acoustically because there's going to be natural drift um but definitely in digital formats it's it makes a big difference even when vibrato is present it's really cool to hear your your insight on that because I don't think a lot of people want to acknowledge it because it's a little bit, it's really difficult to verbally describe that sensation. But perhaps, you know, one could say that the ear is very good at, even if it's got an unsteady sound, sort of mm -hmm. averaging a very oh, yeah. consistent thing in the imagination. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you can think that like between the two, between the peak and the trough of the vibrato, like you're, like you said, you're sort of averaging. So if the peak and the trough are equal distances out, your brain kind of hears the center point and it also does cross the center point. So to me, it's like a timbral, it's like a timbral, like tremolo, if you will, where it's like, yeah. every, as it crosses that midpoint, it locks beyond that. It's almost like it's emphasizing that interval as opposed to obscuring that interval. Can you imagine like a two cent interval? Like if you tried to imagine a yeah. really, really small interval in your head, how small do you think you could go? And would it depend on the range of like, or how high you're imagining it? Mm, I think I could get to about a, a cent or two in my head. Harmonically, I could get probably below a cent. But yeah. like when I'm doing like ear training on a cent, I try to hear it in my head and then play it back and then see how the playback version in my head was tuned in unison or not unison against the actual realized version. So like I'll imagine the sound in my head before I actually play it back. And then I'll hold that sound in my head and then I'll compare it to the actual playback one. And then I'll see if those are unison or not. And if they're phasing, then I know I was off mentally. And if they're unison, then I know I was on mentally. Oh, yeah, cool. Like when you are imagining then uh, a certain tone, are you imagining a particular instrument? Like, um, or are you, is it just like the essence of a tone? Are you imagining like a sine wave or a sawtooth wave? Like, do you Honestly, that's, that's actually an incredibly good question I haven't thought about before. I imagine like a human voice, but reinforced with a stronger sine wave and also 
stronger, higher partials. So it's like, a, it's because when I, when I'm audiating these things, I actually feel it. My, I feel my vocal folds trying to move. And I feel sometimes my eyebrows will raise a little bit when I'm trying to hear an extra scent in my head. Mm -hmm. So it's very connected to my motor skills. So like my auditory and motor skills are very fused. And when I'm doing ear training, whether it's microtonal or not, like it, a lot of my body is involved in the process and a lot of my proprioception is involved. So I would say that what I'm hearing is something like a human voice that's like a, like a, a human voice that's filtered that doesn't have a lot of, um, a lot of like vowel format information to it so that that doesn't get disturbed. And then um, kind of a, a, it's hard to describe really. I've never tried to describe it. It definitely is rooted in a human voice without a lot of resonance added and then reinforced with like higher partials of a saw wave and then a really strong fundamental, even though the fundamental is not what I listen to. That's a really in-depth answer. You know, I might imagine um, something similar. For me, like the act of ear training is so intimately connected to singing that yeah. I usually imagine myself singing. But right, sometimes... me too. Yeah. Part of the sound that I imagine is the feeling. So it's like, I feel this like overwhelmingly loud, like tone structure. And then it just inches up a hair and then there's a scent, you know, or like it's, it's really hard to put into words. And I don't think it's a sound that I could cr really create. I think if I did create it, it would, I, maybe I should try to create it sometime with synthesis and, and see if I could make it. But you know, you cool. can't, you can't attach proprioception to, you know, an auditory sound. I mean, you can experience proprioceptive things out of sound, but so much of it is proprioceptic or um, um, proprioceptive and kinesthetic for me that it's kind of hard to maybe try to put it into a discrete auditory experience. So I guess, um, Cam Taylor, what I could ask you right yeah. off the bat is, how many notes do you think would ever be practical to have it in octave? Or, or what do you think the highest... Uh, reasonable number would be roughly equidistantly spaced, right. of course. Um, I have several answers for you, but it kind of depends. It obviously depends on your musical, like, I guess, usefulness for those notes. And I've got, I guess I've got about three answers and they're all very personal to me. My first answer would be 94 because 94 is my favorite equal temperament. And it's where I guess the practical limit of things is for my, the way that I think about music, like a, like a 12, 12, 13 cent difference is enough to, to sort of show those gradations, let's say between central neutral thirds, between like um, 11, nine and 16, 13, or, you know, cutting a comma in half really. And, and a comma, I think of, of 20 to 30 cents is really where notes start to take on totally different identities. I guess, yeah, around, around about 80, 87, 94 equal. Those are, my favorite tunings around there, where steps are 10 to 15 cents. That's the first answer. But then if you want to go deeper, and, and a lot of people have gone really deep, I'm sure you've gotten great answers from Amelia, for example, um, or Johnny, uh, then the next kind of thing is, is between really, really close intervals and just intonation that have got totally different identities. Or even if you're tuning an acoustic instrument like a piano, if you're tuning up a well temperament, you need to be able to hear much smaller differences. And a 12 cent difference is gonna throw things way out of line. Right. Um, so that's when we get into the realm of say three to four cents. Uh, like the difference between a, a sixth comma mean tone fifth and a pure fifth, about four cents. Um, so tunings like, tunings like Velody, uh, where you've got six, mean tone fifths in about six comma and then six pure fifths, you end up with, yeah, the smallest differences being four cents and then that being stacked up six times up to the comma. And thinking about an equal temperament, I would say 270 or 311. Those would be my big choice there. 270 because it's amazing in 13 limit. It's like the best thing that you can get basically. And probably Joe was the, was the big proponent of that back yes. in the day whenever. I know he advocated for the use of the, the Tredek as like a degree of yeah. 270. Yeah, instead of using sense, basically. It's, it's much bigger than a cent, but for all intents and purposes, if you're working in 13 limit, you don't need that many other distinctions that are smaller than that most of the time. Unless you're using 311. 
unless you're using a 311, exactly. And 311, it just takes things way, way to the next level. If you're thinking about higher prime JI, it's the best thing for, for miles and miles and miles. And it's 41 consistent or something, I think 41 or 43. So we've got like a, I guess a, a coarse range of, of about 12 cents where identities are sort of changing around a little bit. Four cents where we need to distinguish things on, a, on an acoustic instrument for harmonic purposes, it, it sort of changes the quality of that interval. And for melodic purposes, it's, it's like an audible difference. It's a J and D really yeah. at that level. Um, and then if you want to go even further, my other answer was about 2460, uh, which was a great EDO that um, George Secor proposed. And it's really, it really fits the sagittal system's highest precision level in terms of notation. Oh, wow. Um, because it, it distinguishes 0.4 cents, um, the, the schismina, I think he calls it which was the difference between what, what is actually used as the, the symbol for the prime 13, if you're, if you're modifying a minus six to prime 13 to 13A. Um, the symbol that you actually use is not the comma, which should be 1053, 1024. Um, you actually write 3635 because it's easier to write. In the Discord, I heard people call it uh, fudging. And then I read... Um... Mm -hmm. Thomas Nicholson's excellent paper, um, Surprising mm. Connections, where he analyzes some Harry Parch. Okay. And he calls it, I think, enharmonic proximity. I proximity. Think. Yeah, I heard him talk about that the other day on Facebook. Exactly. And he is actually another name I was going to bring up because he's, he's one of the people that I know who's, who's delved into this the deepest. And he's got so many pieces that, that display all these crazy, close, like ridiculously small intervals. And they actually sound different because of the way that he composes them, he, he's like really writing the, the identities as they, as they would be in J.I. And of course they are in J.I. So you can kind of hear the sevenness or you can hear the 13-ness of, of the intervals that he's writing. But I guess the final answer, if you, if you go even further, it's just like, the there is no, yeah, there is no, no limit to that, to that answer. And you can, you can divide the, the octave obviously in, up to an infinite number of, no, it's, I mean, uh, Subrag, who I think you, you've talked to recently, I want to listen to that episode soon. Um, oh, yes. His, his instrument's called the infinitone, right? There is the idea that, that that interval spectrum is infinitely dividable. And we've also talked about, um, yeah, pitches being like, uh, you know, are they same or different? And then, like, if there's a little timbre clue, you know that, like, different is a thing. Yeah. Um, but you might not be able to hear high or low. Like, and I think that's the characteristic quality of something being below a just noticeable difference melodically is it's very hard to tell if it's up or down. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And for me, um, if it's purely melodic, it gets really tricky after about three or four cents. It's possible, oh, yeah. but yeah. it's not reliable. And I could get down to one cent one day, but I don't think I could repeat that on a random day without any training. Right, like you yeah. could have to put yourself in that in that context, train right. yourself up to it. See, your ear sounds a lot like mine. Um, it's like mm. there's, there's like this three four cent area that's just like really down in there, and like two and one is like you're kind of questioning it. It's like if you yeah you're guessing. Yeah, it's like if you're in the mix and um you thought you bypassed the compressor, but you really didn't, and it was doing almost nothing, and you're like, oh, I'm hearing right. this now. Oh wait, that wasn't even on. And it's like that. It's like yeah, did right. that really move? But then, like, harmonically, things are in a different league again. And yeah, yeah. Two or three or four cents harmonically is, like, it's pretty obvious. If oh, you're yeah. tuning a piano and you're tuning those unisons, if the unisons are more than a cent out, basically, you've got three, three strings that are less than a cent out, you're still going to hear it. Yeah, so exactly. That's just, like, that's kind of crazy what a human ear can do in that sense. Yeah, it's, it's really, really amazing. The other thing I was going to add is I did a little experiment because there was that discussion about, you know, can, it, can you hear a scent? I went oh, off and right. did a little experiment on Scala, just listening and seeing if I could hear, like, chorus effects and, like, harmonic, I guess, checking my harmonic J&D. And I listened to, like, five cent differences. I was like, yeah, definitely easy. 
and then two de- two cents and i was like oh yeah sweet one cent all good then i went to half a cent and i was like oh actually i can hear i can hear half a cent that's all right yeah and then i went lower and it was like 0.1 cents and some of the time i was guessing but that actual like the timbral difference of a 0.1 cent unis- uh, unison or chorus versus a 0.2 cent chorus is quite different versus like a pure unison so i got it down to 0.05 cents i think yeah but i wouldn't be able to repeat that on a on a random day it's very fun to try and think about how how low that can go in like just a Mm. situation where you're using air training like a kind of a harmonic j and d actually the reason i i did that there was another reason is because i wanted to find like the optimal tuning for JI. It sounds weird because I didn't, I'm not always thinking about JI as being the exact ratio, but like right. what's the optimal tuning for a, for a 13A? And for me, it was like 0.3 or 4 cents above where it should be oh. um, for almost all the primes. Like I wanted, I wanted prime three about 0.2 cents sharp, like 702.15 cents or something. Um, I wanted most of the primes to be slightly sharp. And that was just based on that little scalar experiment. I wonder if that would, that would stack up. That's amazing. So you were um, tuning things by ear then, and yep. then checking to see how close you were, and that's how close you were kind of every time? I input a bunch of values, and I didn't know which one I was hitting, um, but I would just listen. So I, I would have like, I don't know, 20 different values for, for 3 2, um, anywhere between like 701 cents and 703 cents kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and as much as I love gentle fifths, which are, you know, 703 and a bit, 704, um, you can hear that they're not 3-2. Doing all these experiments, like, two or three octaves away from where I did them, they wouldn't be possible. And my answer was, would be very different. Then. Yeah. Well, that's really, really insightful. Um, I was also wondering um, about how you audiate melodic differences below a J and D. Is that something you can do? Mm. Like, can you think of a pitch and then think of a pitch four cents higher? Um, like, how fuzzy is that? I'm trying it out. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know what pitch you're thinking of. I, I'm, gonna I'm just thinking of a too. fourth. Um, like a perfect fourth and then a mean tone fourth and then a super pipe fourth. Yeah. I don't really know difficult. if I could do it below six cents or so without any audio clues. Yeah. I think that's about where about where I am. Because that's usually where I get to the point, six, seven cents is usually where I get to the point where I notice something's out of, like, where it's not the expected sound. That makes sense? Like, if I'm hearing, yeah. um, like, like a fudging of, of 224, 225, if I yeah. hear that, that 225 instead of the, the just seventh, instead of seven, four, then I'll notice it much more readily as like, oh, that's, that's kind of out of, tune i don't know if that's the right word there but you know it's like it's a noticeably different quality rather than just being a different shading within that same that same note are there any contexts where you think that melodically moving by a just noticeable difference would be something that would matter in music to your ears it's sort of like the intellect can sometimes make distinctions that the ear tempers out you could say the ear can't detect the difference like I think it, by classically, I know there are three classic ratios for a, what I call a small, a small uh, central Zalzalian third. And then the ratios are 39 and 32, which have been seen, it gives in the early 11th century. And then there's, it's a really interesting one, 72 to 59, which you'd get, it, there's a simple reason you'd get that fretting and oud, because you can, you can put, to put a fret midway between the standard Pythagorean frets at nine, eight, and four to three, and you get 72 to 59. You just bisect that distance. It's more about getting an interval through some method that might happen to differ from a- another slightly different method by just a small amount. Well, I play that note on my key where I think I'm playing an 11 to nine, but I think I'm also doing a reasonable job on a, you know, on a 72 to 59. And right. of course, the relevant, the relevant thing that uh, Jacques Dudon pointed out he he is very intimately familiar with these classical Near Eastern tunings, but he made a point. The special thing about if you if you play if you play three notes at 
48 to 59 to 72, you get differences of 11 and 13, which are quite close to what to the ratios you're approximating of 11 to 9, and you know, and 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 the, the 39 to 32. So he so there's there's he has, gets into differential coherence and sort of you know closeness. And it's quite fascinating. He looked he looked at difference tones, and that's a unique thing about that. The harmony of uh, pitches that are very, very close to just intonation, but maybe just a little bit off, like about a just noticeable difference off. Pitches that are sort of almost a J and D off of just, and then pitches that sort of have this even smaller range where you don't really notice. Like the J and D can almost take this sort of character where it's difficult to maybe tell which direction uh, up or down is. Um, I also wanted you wanted to ask you a question about sort of audiating that distance. Um, do you think that there's anything around the area of the just noticeable difference that causes you to imagine pitch differently? Can you think of a pitch two cents higher in your head depending on the register? Like how, what do you think that smallest distance is for you? See, the thing is, I, I, have, I have what I call semi-commas, where it is meaningful. Ben Cena said this a millennia, almost a millennium ago. Uh, he said that, that really good musicians will understand the distinction between 12 to 13 and 13 to 14. And um, that's the difference of 169 to 168. And that's about 10 cents difference. But that, that's, that's larger than the J and D. And I will make that distinction. I, I, will play, I will play 12 to 13 to 14 as a melodic theme versus, versus say, 14 to 13 to 12, the smaller step first as a melodic theme. And I, and I do recognize, and, and it's a big, very important in Macomb music, you say take 11 to 12 to 13 versus 13 to 12 to 11. Uh, that that distinction of 144 to 143 roughly, uh, it's it's to 12 cent difference. So I think around 10 to 12 cents is where, where, where I would consider it really significant. Thank you for your extremely specific answer. That's really helpful um, in figuring out um, sort of the contexts of how small certain intervals can be, especially within sort of a historical vein based on what other musicians have said in the past um, when they didn't have the same sorts of tuning resources that we had. Do you think most musicians can hear melodic steps below a J and D? Or do you think that that is, you know, do you think that's a very small number of people who can do that? Or do you think most people could train down to that level of maybe, as you said, being able to distinguish a 13 over 12 from a 14 over 13? The 13 to 12 will have a feeling. See, the 14 to 13 has a creative ambiguity. You can hear that as, as a large semitone if you want to. I mean, I use, I take it that I'm, if I'm improvising in a 14th century style in, in a European manner, I'm not, I'm, not try, I'm not intentionally trying to bring in Near Eastern illusions. I will, I can accept, I can accept going down from F sharp to F, which is 126 cents in my tuning system. I can accept that as a semitone sound, so I can play F sharp. B flat, E flat, going out to F, C, F, and and it's it's like a cadence on to F with a descending semitone. That's really remote. That's remote from a 14th century perspective. And of course, Ugolino and Prostochimos who wanted to use a 17 tone Pythagorean gamut in order to be able to do that. Do you feel that there are any psychological phenomena that mess with your pitch perception that you hear in music? I'm, I'm sure there's situations which probably could mislead me. I've, I've heard I've heard about shepherd tones. It could be sort of, sort of oral illusions. I'm sure that would that would fool my ears. I know that um, the perceived brightness of a sound can affect the um, pitch. Well, the perceived pitch by up to 15 cents. So it definitely seems like there are certain instruments that are more equipped to handle these sorts of precise measurements and, and feelings and all of that stuff. Maybe like harpsichord is one and perhaps the oud is another, uh, one that you'd be very familiar with, I think. An important point about the oud, which is really interesting, is that it was fretted, it was fretted in this classical period of, say, from, from about the 10th to the 15th centuries. But of course, it, it, in modern use, it doesn't have frets with a flexible pitch instrument. And I know that a lot of Arab performers will emphasize that. Is there anything else you want to mention about a J and D um, or a really, really small size of microtone that you think will be pertinent for, for anyone watching this video? Yeah, I think, I think that the interesting thing I just mentioned, if I had to make one observation, that when you have melody, I think because this, this ties in with the idea of 
I, I think Jackie Le Legan wrote this up to me back in 2002. So this is almost 20 years ago that when, when you have, yeah, I mean, Wilson studied this in detail. When you get, and of course, a lot of, a lot of traditional uh, tunings are based on, when you deal with an arithmetic series, you know, say like 20 to 19, 18 to 17, as with, as with Kathleen Schlesinger's Harmonii, uh, that you have that you have that subtle gradation of super particular steps. It's an interesting question: how small a difference the ear can hear, can can hear. But I can certainly say ten to twelve cents is enough to make a difference. So I guess what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask you about how you perceive very very small microtones, perhaps near or around the just noticeable difference. Um, because as we've talked about with a few of our other guests, the just noticeable difference is sort of like an average, uh, a fuzzy line, and not really an absolute. So there are uh, situations in which one can hear melodic steps of less than a just noticeable difference. So um, since you're definitely one of those people, um, I just wanted to ask you a lot of questions about that, some of which we've gone over. The first question I want to ask you is if you prefer music using straighter tones, because of all of the vibrato that can happen in performance. I answered that I do not listen so much as I initiate pitch in my career. I hear a melody, a contour, a relationship. My formula for playing in consecutive sense is not at all based on listening. It's based on recall and comparison. What I mean by that is that I have to use my mind. So from, from a perspective of mind, I'm hearing less than a cent because I have to play in tune. In other words, as an orchestral bassoon player on, the, on a professional level, I hear an oval player play an A, 440. But the A stops, and then other people start to play. Right? Right. And so I have to hear that A in my head. It's got to have a stable mental place. Yes, yes. Absolutely. And then I play my instrument, and I've got to make the instrument match what's in my head. My head can't move. Well, I'm saying I'm not counting beats, am I, if I'm trying to match it in my head? No, I, I wouldn't think you would. I mean, perhaps you could imagine you could imagine it beating, but I don't think anyone can imagine that being like pitch height, really. So it's something that happened because of question number five, which is what's your process when ear training to figure out how big an interval is? And I answered, my ear training began with the cork, I think it's a 212 tuner, which has long been discontinued. And it trained, it trained a generation of New York musicians and maybe nationally, if not internationally, to hear 12 tone equal exactly. And it was used to tune the New York Philharmonic by Oboist Joe Robinson, who was a friend of mine, still lives on Facebook. And this is the way Ron Kozak and Skip LaPlante, and when I put his name twice, I meant to write John Catla, were all masters of that extinct chord tuner. John Catla, I can tell you that even a pianist, Jesse Pierce, are people who could hear one cent. And that means that well, let's talk about what hearing a cent means, of course, similarly to how we talked about what dividing up the octave means. Um, does hearing a cent mean that they can name the cent size of an interval fairly accurately, or does it mean that if they're presented with two different intervals that differ by a cent, that they'll be able to tell? Or do you think it's uh, more than that? I guess I'm, well, I'm having difficulty that. forming what that really means. I hear you. Uh, I'm trying to figure out an example. I'll tell you what resounds in my mind when you ask me that question, okay? Okay. It's a, I don't want to give you a name. Okay. And the person playing was microtonal. But the signal of the tone, which by the word tone, tone is not pitch, not pitch frequency. It's, it's you know, the, the amalgam, you know, the frequencies above it, the harmonics, the overtones. Right? So this playing, was off by one cent, two cents, three cents, four cents. You could tell. And it was off on one note. In other words, it wasn't stable. The note wasn't stable. So, like, sometimes it sounded like it was coming from above. 
sometimes it sounds like it's coming from below. You know, it's hard to imitate that, you know, by singing over the telephone. If you were here in person, I would do it, though. I think I, I sort of understand what you're saying. You're saying that um, tones that are off by a subliminal amount or a less than J and D amount sort of convey an impression of the space not exactly matching up, maybe? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. The fact that the mental ability of the musician is a, you know, to hold it exact, but that the instrument is incapable of matching that exactness, you know, in a, uh, 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 I guess it's, <laughs> I hate to use a big word, um, you know, it's like um, something that would be true for other people, you know, of the same level. You know, it, it, it's a nauseous feeling that you get. I see. More than that, you're going to hear it's one cent off, two cents off, three cents off. So I'm wondering, based on our talks about how we hear sense in a performance, what you think sort of the borderline of being able to miss intervals is. Because as far as I understand it, if one is, Im is imagining an interval or audiating a note very clearly after hearing it, that's extremely accurate. Now, um, I don't know quite how accurate it is. I wonder if you could describe that to me personally, how accurate you think that audiation recall is. Um, I know uh, you think it's probably at least accurate within a cent for sure, um, based on uh, the talks that we've had, but I'm wondering if you think that goes lower or if you just think it's almost infinitesimally accurate, really. Well, this technique of, of ascent is exactly what I try to do when I do performances of Harry Park. So, like, you know, if you want to get a sense of how I do it, I hear it in my head before I do it, just like every musician anyway. Right. Right, I hear, you know, musicians should hear a couple of measures in their head before they play. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if I hear, you know, but once I actually sing the notes, I'm not listening to it, and I'm not measuring it. Right. Right. I'm still moving. I'm still involved in the future stuff. Wait, so do you think then the the way that musicians hear music in 12 tone equal temperament can ruin their categorical pitch perception when they're dealing with other kinds of music that doesn't use that tuning system? Do you think it's a detrimental influence? Well, I mean, I think you're right to have asked the question that if you're brought up in an equal temperament kind of uh, society, how do you break out of it? Right. And uh, I remember being very uh, full of anxiety just trying to find a single quarter tone when there's nobody to talk to. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you not only have to be sure about where it is to hear it, you have to be sure how to play it and be sure to be able to do it every time. Right. It's very difficult. When you have two steps that are melodically different from each other, you kind of have this zone around the just noticeable difference where it becomes possible to hear that something has changed, but it's more difficult to hear up or down. So that's sort of like how I'm separating that zone. Um, based I, I understand, but I think it's partly just the, the, the honestly, it's the geekness of both of us to, to even focus on this. Like most people just, it's not even in this fear of, you know, being aware Right. If, you know, if something is wrong, the first thing they hear is it's wrong. Right. It's out of tune. Yeah, yeah. And out of tune means it's sour. Mm. Right? It, it doesn't even tell you if it's sharp or it's flat. We're just, you know, very detailed about it. And we're focusing on it. And, you know, you know my history of demonstrating and playing it trying to get people to be aware of it. Hearing these sorts of small intervals, maybe even melodically, might be more about having a certain feeling and understanding what that really means than estimating size, per se. Yes, because, you know, while I can tell you that I can play a brain number, uh, I think it was brain number four on auto recorder, and I was holding a long note. And, you know, we use tricks to hold long notes, you know, like we, we try to look long distance, we took, look for some spot on the wall and play to the spot. You know, there are all kinds of little tricks to try to make the long note work. But I wanted the note to, like, really be succulent. Right. And I couldn't use vibrato. Right, yeah. So I started to use sense 
as a flavoring device. Ah, uh, yeah. But but you know what I ended up doing though is after having done that little kind of exercise with the one cent two cent business. Yeah. I stopped doing that intellectually. Right. And it just made it warm. I just played it warm. When you hear an instrument that's playing with a lot of vibrato so that there isn't an exact pitch center accurately within the scent. Um, what does your brain, too, do in terms of pitch perception? Um, are you sort of imagining a very certain tone and the vibrato is deviating away from it? Are you getting, like, an impression of pitch at a certain place? Or does your actual pitch perception kind of track how high or low it feels scent-wise? Well, it's a good question. There's one very famous singer who I have difficulty listening to because her vibrato is too large. Oh. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah Vaughan. She's quite famous. But the, I would say vibrato is context-based. So if I'm going to play Renaissance music, one to a part, I'm not going to use it. If I'm going to be in a crowd, you know, a bunch of people, Vibrato is handy because people have the same, they play the same vibrato and they sound like a group. So clearly we can hear pretty far down and in perhaps the most extreme case, even melodically below a scent just slightly. But there's yet another way we can hear even smaller pitch differences and that is through beating. For those of you who haven't heard of it, Beating is an intriguing phenomenon that happens between two sounds that are almost in tune, but not quite. If you add two sinusoids together in a graph, i.e. combine the sound wave, you can see that the sound fades in and out of volume. These little fades can be visibly heard if the beating is slow enough. It's easy to figure out how quickly something will beat. Just subtract the two frequencies and you'll have the time it takes. As an effect, it can be used to give things a shimmery sound for phase and to simulate detuning. They are also used to tune instruments. You can hold two notes together that beat and tune until the note sounds exactly the same, like on a guitar. It turns out that with certain sounds such as sawtooth waves that we can absolutely hear a pitch change of less than a cent because the resulting chord starts to beat differently when the two notes are held together. Here's an example. So if pitch becomes a form of beating control, then much, much smaller differences can matter. So, how small could you go? Amusingly, we could hold two extremely close sine waves against each other for a really long time, starting at completely destructive interference, and then wait for them to create a single beat. Imagine doing that for 24 hours, for example. Your pitch difference would need to be minuscule, and we could calculate it. Think about it. We just need to know the time it takes in seconds, which is what Hertz uses, and then find the scent difference between those two pitches. For example, at 440 Hertz, we would need to hold another wave at 441 Hertz to cycle through a single beat. And so, the difference between 441 and 440 is 1 Hertz. So 1 beat per second.
So then, if we wanted to make the beat longer, well, we take 440, and then our, our other wave, then, that's slightly higher, is 440 plus one half, right? Because that's one over two. So one beat every two seconds. So then 440 and 440.05 together, held together, should give us uh, one beat every two seconds. Similarly, 440 against 440 plus a fourth should give us a beat every four seconds. So let's see how many seconds are in a day. Uh... Looks like it's 86,400. So if I were to divide 1 by 86,400, I get... This number! 0.00001157 So then 440 point... 0.00001157 And 440, if you held them together, should beat for an entire day. That actually doesn't seem like that big of a difference. But don't worry, our differences can get bigger. What would be the smallest pitch difference we could ever hear under these criteria? We just calculated a beat that will last 24 hours. So really, we need to calculate the longest beat between two sine waves that a human could ever hear as of, uh, I guess, April 26th, 2021, which is when I'm making this video. Let's just assume all of the sound equipment is impractically powerful and precise so we can take things to their maximum, blah blah blah, for the sake of hypothetical, and that psychoacoustics won't interfere too much, which I'm sure it would if you were to actually do this. So as pitch goes higher, adjacent pitches a hertz apart will become closer and closer in pitch height. For example, the distance between 100 and 101 hertz is about 17.226 cents, and the difference between... Well, a thousand and one and a thousand hertz is about 1.73 cents. Since we want the smallest pitch distance possible but still hearable, we need to go to the highest pitch humans are normally recorded as being able to hear, uh, around 20,000 hertz. This is approximate and I don't know of any world record highest pitch heard, or I would use that. So if anyone does know that, please let me know. As for the amount of time, in order to be, uh, safe, we need to make the beat last the entire length of the longest recorded human lifetime. So let's dive into calculating how long this beat would be. The longest recorded human lifetime is Gene Comets, who lived for 122 years and 164 days. Assuming 365 days in a year, this is 44,694 days. 44,694 days equals 1,072,656 hours, and 1,072,656 hours equals 64,359,360 minutes, which is equal to uh, 3,861,561,600 seconds. So, the period of our beat needs to be 1 over this value, or 1.0000000000258962591714191481498055 hertz. Thus, our two beating frequencies are 20,000 hertz and 20,000.000000000025896 blah 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 hertz. The ratio between these, which we can simply get by taking one over the other, is 1.0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
equals 0 0.0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
I haven't uploaded to my SoundCloud very much lately because I'm trying to focus on bigger projects, which is the exact opposite of what the free market wants me to do. Only singles matter now. EPs don't matter at all. Albums don't matter at all. But I don't care about that. Um, I like big projects, so I'm probably going to be uploading to Bandcamp uh, if I do anything big. You can also check out my Patreon account. Um, if I get 60 patrons, I will go back to making Now and Zen episodes. And we are so close. We are only 15 patrons away. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Really appreciate it. And again, of course, I have to thank my patrons for this video. Uh, they were extremely helpful uh, in terms of criticism, ideas, all that stuff. The Zen Harmonic Gods are Mike Battaglia, Sheldon Bird, Barry Lemon, Ari Cello, Adam Fries, Matthew Sheeran, Vincenzo Sicarella, Hector McGuffin, Christopher Bailey, Leland O. Weigel, Amy Coleman, Joe Weigel, and Tina Harmon Carteau. So thank you very much, Zen Harmonic Gods. This channel appreciates you so very, very much. And thanks to our Zen Harmonic patrons as well. Okay, see you all next time. <laughs>